morning. Good morning. All right. Well, we do have a familiar passage today, as we've said, so it should be short, right? Should be. Um, <laughs> I know nobody has any football games to go to today or anything like that, so, you know. So, yeah, familiar passage, and um, we're about to, to get a lot of words thrown at you, and uh, I'm thankful that you're here and you're staying. That's great. Um, this, this weekend normally is a, a light weekend for attendance with so many at camp and, and away and, and that, so I'm glad you're here this morning, and I pray that the Spirit of God would, would just bring something to your mind today, um, that he would do more uh, that, that, than I can. Um, so that's where... We're going to start with just a word of prayer, and, um, and I want to say there's, there's, one, there's one word I really want you to remember today. We're, we're going to cover um, a lot of things we're going to say. We're not going to cover a lot of passages. We're going to stick pretty close to the text. We might jump back to Genesis for a few minutes. But the one word I want you to take away today is this, the word surrender. Because as I kind of went through this and thinking through it, I'm like, what am I going to say that hasn't been said and, and, and all those kinds of things? The word that came to my mind and the word that kind of like dropped in my lap this week was surrender. So um, kind of keep that in the back of our heads and uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father, we do bow in your presence. It's another day and we give you thanks that you've given us a day uh, where we have health and, and life. And, and we can know more of you today, Father. So we just pray that the Spirit of God would be hovering over this place, that it would shine light on the page, that it would encourage us, that it would even bring forth uh, something anew and afresh. We'd ask these things that, uh, in your Son's name and for his glory. Amen. All right. So, you know, we're done with Romans 9 through 11. That was really hard work going through those passages. I'm glad I didn't have those. I'm grateful for those that did. And I thought I was off the hook, but then Ben last week kind of talked about the connection between 11 and 12, and, and um, you know, I was like, yeah, I agree with him. That's, that's definitely there. It seemed like Paul was bringing us, you know, on a destination, a culmination, if you will, uh, a decision point. Uh, it brought Paul to a sense of uh, a worship that he had closed chapter 11 with. And then in chapter 12, Ben mentioned that word, therefore. Right, and it's in chapter 12 and verse 1. I'm reading from the ESV, but I'm going to bounce back and forth between ESV and New King James, and hopefully that doesn't offend anybody. If it does, um, you can keep it to yourself. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I appeal to you, therefore. So right in the, the first verse, there's only two verses today, so that shouldn't take us very long, right? You would think that. But the simple word, therefore, is there. And that's a connection point, right? It's telling us to go back. So when we think those chapters in 9 through 11 are parenthetical, as some used to say, and I would say that's not true, but some would say that, right? And I would think that they are right there for a reason. And I think they're there to shine light on the page of the two verses that we're going to look at today. I would submit they support these two passages here. So the word therefore... I think chapters 1 through 11 is really an introduction to these two verses. And I would say, arguably, these are the two most important verses in the book of Romans. And I did use the word arguably because there's a lot of good verses in the book of Romans. But for today, they're the most important. And it's bringing you to this place, right? It's a destination. It wants you to make a logical decision based on what you have read in chapters 1 through 11. That's, that's the purpose of it. That's what's going on. I really believe when the Spirit of God set out to write the Bible and give it to us, that line upon line is arranged by him and is taking us on a journey. He's taking us somewhere, right? And it's not a par parenthetical portion, I believe. And the, the word, therefore, is there just for that purpose. I believe it. Um, so, you know, there's four therefores. There's more therefores than that, but there's four that I want to bring out in the previous 11 chapters, right? The first one I want to look at is in Romans 3 and 20. 
I would submit to you that when you see these therefores, that they are a summation, they are a transition point. He's going from one thought to the other. Okay? So in, in 320, it says this in Romans 320, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So here we find out we're not justified by the law. In fact, the law just gives us knowledge of our sin. So we're not justified by the law. In fact, another word might be condemned, right? We're condemned. Guilty before God. Got it. Check mark. Guilty before God condemned. Point number one. Second time it's going to come out is in chapter 5 and verse 1, right? Uh, Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we learn how we are to be justified. That is by faith. Kind of like Abraham and David, right? In chapter 4. He's proven a point. So, the just shall live by faith. So the word, justified. First word, condemned. Second word, justified. Check mark, got it. Pshh. Right? Third time, Romans 8 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is therefore no condemnation. Which is very good news for us, because no matter how hard we try, we're going to keep messing up while we're in the flesh. That's what Paul was experiencing in Romans 7. If we think that we have problems struggling in the flesh, guess what? We're, we're on the same plane as Paul. He said, you know, I tried to do it the right way. I ended up messing up, and I did what I didn't want to do. So Paul, no matter how hard, messed up. So the word for this one, assurance. Right? Assurance. Got it. Check mark. The fourth time is in our verse today. In Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore. Or I beseech you, therefore. Right? I beseech you, therefore. And I think it's based on all of these thoughts that we've gone through in, 11, in these 11 chapters and all that we've been studying. But this one, the key word, I think, is a little more difficult. The key word I'm going to suggest that we use for this, therefore, is dedication. Dedication. And when you put the check mark by the got it, I'm not so sure about this one, right? I'm not so sure I'm in for this one. I'm not so sure both feet are in on this one. Because it's hard. And so we'll read verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Other translations will talk about your reasonable service in the word beseech instead of appeal in the New King James. But here's why I believe Romans 9 through 11 is right where it's supposed to be. Because he's asking us to become a living sacrifice, right? And think that through for a second. You know, a living sacrifice. Does that mean everything? Hmm. So if he's asking for everything, are you going to want to commit yourself to someone who doesn't keep their promises? I don't think you do. Um, if you're going to give your life for something, you want to make sure it's a good thing, right? It's, it's something that's worth living for. It's not a lost cause. Um, you want to make sure that you trust who is on the other end, and he is worth serving, if you will. So God has made a lot of promises throughout history and, and through even in the book of Romans, right? And how is this history keeping promises? Are you going to want to serve him if he doesn't keep his promises? Just, you know, honest question. You know, what do you think about that? If he failed to come through, would you want to give your life for him? Would you want to be a living sacrifice? Is he worth living for? He opens, you know, this word 
of, of, of chapter 12 with um, I appeal in the ESV or I beseech you in the New King James. And it's based on the mercies of God. The verse 1 there talks about brothers by the mercies of God. He makes his appeal, he makes his argument, if you will, based on the mercies of God. And the mercies of God, we've just kind of hit on a high level of those four therefores. We were condemned, we were guilty. And we found ourselves justified by faith. And we have assurance of salvation. It can't be taken away from us. The mercies of God. And the word there, when he talks about the mercies of God, he talks about presenting your bodies, a living sacrifice, presenting your bodies. And I think the word present there is about, a, it's a once for all thing, right? It, it, uh, it's a command. It, it you know, is a definite commitment of our body to the Lord. Kind of like marriage, right? When the bride and the groom get together, they have a day when they committed themselves to each other. It's a once-for-all commitment, but it does determine how they're going to live, what they're going to do with their bodies. That's the same idea of the word present here in, in, in verse 1. And he gives uh, you know, a reason for this. It's the right response to all that God has done for us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. It's the right response. And also, it's also a reasonable service based on all that he's done for us. It would be the right thing to do. So it means every day that we get up and we do this. You know, it's like a day of worship to the Lord. We just look at it as a normal day going through our routine. Uh, but it's actually to him, as he looks down and sees that we're laying our, our life aside for his and wanting to live his way, it's, it's an idea of worship to him. It's our spiritual worship or uh, reasonable service in King, King James. And this idea of a living sacrifice, that includes giving your body for him. And when I kind of digested that a little bit and kind of took it in, a living sacrifice, right? And I contrasted all those old sacrifices of the Old Testament because the Lord's had thousands upon thousands of animals sacrificed to him, if you will. And the picture in my mind is that that animal that was sacrificed, you know, all of its life was sacrificed there. All of its activities was sacrificed there. Um, the total sum of its life um, sacrificed there. But I think the difference here is, is huge in the sense that when that animal was sacrificed, you know, it didn't have a choice. It cost the owner a couple bucks to do it for the Lord, but it didn't have a choice, right? And here, we're going to do that willingly for the Lord. And I would submit that brings huge amounts of enjoyment to the Lord, right? Um, we have a choice to lay down our lives. We have a choice to do that for him. He died for us, and we're going to live for him. And I think, you know, that is something that he would smell those burnt offerings going up, and that brought a sweet aroma to him. How much more today... You know, when we lay down our lives for him, that he gets great joy of those things when we serve him. And Paul would say that's our reasonable service. That is the logical thing to do, is for us to live for him. And the one question that I have, you know, is do you really think God doesn't have our best interest in mind? Isn't that one of the biggest fears of serving him, that he's going to send us somewhere we don't want to go or have us do something we don't want to do? And, you know, I think the biggest fear we have is that we don't trust him in the sense that he's going to provide what's best for us. He knows what we need, and we don't trust him with that. We're afraid of doing that. And I would say serving God, too, I think some of the definitions that we have of serving God might be different, right? So serving God, I think, is, is serving him right where you're at and what he's called you to do. It's not always going to camp although that's a good thing. It's not always teaching Sunday school. That's a good thing. But serving God may be just doing what he's called you to do. Being faithful in your marriage, right? Being a good dad. Being a good mom. Staying consistent in those things. Day in and day out. 
Because you never know when you're serving God in those capacities and doing what he's called us to do and keeping your promise to him. You know, you, when you got married, you made promises to him before a group of people and before God. And keeping those promises may be difficult at times. It may not be the easiest thing to do. But that's a lot of times when God uses us. When people are watching and they ask, you know, I see that you're going through a tough time. How are you doing it? And guess what? You'd be like, hey, I'm getting support by the Lord. He's, you know, walk me, walking me through it, helping me get through it. And people ask questions. And guess what? You're still serving God that day. Because they would never see him unless you were obedient to your calling. And teaching Sunday school is good. Don't get me wrong. But being obedient to the life that he called you, being a witness for him now, is still being a living sacrifice. It still is. So I want to move forward just for a moment about this idea of reasonable service or spiritual worship, if you will. When you think about all that he's done for us, he's given us so much. He's given us what we don't even understand yet, right? Right? We don't even comprehend the things that he's done for us. And yet, Paul would say it's, it's reasonable, it's the right thing to do to serve him in this way. He has done so much for him, us. C.S. Lewis said this, and I, I want to read what C.S. Lewis said to us, because I think there's a lot of truth in it. C.S. Lewis said this, the terrible thing, and I think he means awesome thing, or the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self all your wishes and precautions to Christ. But it is far easier than what we are trying to do instead. For what we are trying to do is to remain what we call ourselves, to keep our personal happiness our great aim in life, and yet at the same time be good. We are trying to let our minds and hearts go their own way, centered on money or pleasure or ambition, and hoping in spite of this to behave honestly, chastely, and humbly. And that is exactly what Christ warned us you could not do. As he said, a thistle cannot produce figs. If I am a field that contains nothing but grass, I cannot produce wheat. Cutting the grass may keep it short, but it will still produce grass and no wheat. If I want to produce wheat, I need to change the change must go deeper than the surface. It must be plowed up and re-sown. There's a lot of truth in that, right? It's impossible. I think it's challenging. It's hard to give our whole lives to Christ and just let him do with it as he sees fit. We want to keep back a little bit of it, right? We want to hold on to a little bit of it. We want to direct a little bit. And that's where my word comes in. My word, surrender, right? Surrender can be defined as to give up completely. But I think it's the key to our passage today. To the world, surrender means defeat, right? But to the believers, surrender is going to mean victory to us. And personally, this is where I think we stall. This is where we stumble. I wonder why we're not making progress in the Christian life. I wonder where God is in our lives and where is the power that's supposed to be displayed and why does sin reign over us certain times? It's because we're stuck. We want people to see Christ in us, but they don't because we are stuck. And I think, you know, <clears throat> we either got off the altar, if you will, that we're talking about here, about that living sacrifice. We either got off the altar or we never got on the altar. 
We just want to run things our own way. It's like, thank you very much, Lord, for saving me. You know, great meeting today, great message today. I'll see you next Sunday, right? That's the idea. But, you know, when I think about this, this idea of living sacrifice, um, it's costly, right? It's costly. And he's going to tell us how to do it in verse 2. We're not even at that point yet. But before we get to verse 2, I want to just kind of think about some examples uh, from the Old Testament that we might have. And um, I have uh, three men that I think were fit for the master's use, if you will. Familiar story, talk about it in Sunday school all the time, um, but I would say they surrendered to God's will. And, and you guys know the story in Daniel 3, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, I'm going to make this 90-foot-tall statue, and when the music plays, you have to fall down and worship it. And um, if you don't, you're going to get thrown into the fire, if you will. And, um, you know, these guys, these three guys, I think their, their faith, if you will, they practice it much beyond just eating habits and lip service, if you will, right? It was going to cost them their whole body if they choose uh, not to obey Nebuchadnezzar in this. And, you know, that's what happened. The day came when they were put to the test. And they were thrown into the fire. We know the story, right? And from the top to the bottom, you know, that fire was heated, I think, seven times hotter. And the guys that threw them in died because of the heat. And yet they were in the fire. There was three of them thrown in. And, and Nebuchadnezzar says, look, there's, wasn't there four? There's four look like they're walking around in there, right? And they're not touched. And he pulls them out of the fire. And, you know, they were faithful to the Lord. They were faithful to the Lord. What would it take to do that? Think about that for a second, really. You know, we're going to be threatened to be thrown into the fire unless you bow down and worship. And I would, I would submit this, that, that they had made a decision that they were going to give their bodies to the Lord, that they, they were steadfast in their mind, and they made up their will to not bend. I think those are the three keys. They gave their bodies, their mind was steadfast, and they gave their will. They didn't bend. They didn't bend. When it came time to it, they didn't bend. What's that word again? Surrender, right? They surrendered to do what the Lord wanted them to do. One example. One example. How about Isaac in Genesis 22, right? Isaac, I think he's a type of a living sacrifice, if you will. Um, Abraham was called by the Lord to go to, I think it was Mount Moriah, take his son, take some wood, take an altar, take your son, some ripe rope and a knife, and, and let's go offer your son. And Abraham got up a week later. No, I think it's scripture say the next day. Three days? Abraham did it. And they went, and uh, they went to where God had told them to go. He built the altar. In verse 9 of that passage, he built the altar. He laid the wood in order. He bound his son. Think about that for a second. He bound his son, right? Isaac didn't fight back. He bound him. He didn't fight back. He laid him on the altar, right? Raised the knife, ready to take him, and God reached out and provided the lamb. When I'm thinking about Isaac, I'm like, that word again pops up, right? Isaac surrendered. He didn't fight. He surrendered to do God's will. As a young man, you'd think he'd fight. I would think he'd fight. But yet, he surrendered. He submitted. His mind must have been to be able to trust God. He must have been able to trust God. Just unbelievable. When I think about those little stories, and there's plenty of other stories, right? The Lord Jesus is the ultimate living sacrifice, right? He came, he died for us, yet he rose again, and he ever lives to make intercession for us. So he went through the cross, right? He gave his body, right? He set his mind to do the Lord's will, and and he committed himself to it. 
and yet he still lives. God seated him on the right hand, and uh, the best living sacrifice, if you will, of all. So these are reasons why Paul is urging us, he's appealing to us, he's nudging us, saying, hey, this is what you should do. This is spiritual worship. Give yourself, your bodies, as a living sacrifice for God. Verse 2. Verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's the ESV. And the New King James is, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. So we're not to be conformed to this world. That's how it starts out. And um, by this world here, I think it means the society or the system that we have, whatever we've built ourselves around to make us happy without God. I think that's why there's so much going on out there today that, you know, we, we're striving to be happy without God. The God of this world, Satan, seeks to attract and hold people through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, 1 John 2, 16. And he's very effective at trapping us, that trapping men, without even saying a word. He doesn't even have to say words, and yet he, we fall into his trap. The other place in the New Testament where the word conformed is used is in 1 Peter 1, 14, where it's a similar thought. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the, your former lust is in your ignorance. Don't conform yourselves. The word conformed and also the word transformed in this passage are commands. They are gotta do's. Gotta do them. They're both commands. Be con not conformed to this world, but transformed. They're commands. In fact, I would submit this. I would submit that if we don't get these two things right about not being conformed to the world and not having our mind transformed by the renewing of the mind, if we don't get those two things right, the rest of Romans 12 we can't do. I would submit that. We can't go ahead and start using your gifts. You can't go ahead and start serving the Lord. You can't be obedient to government. It takes about being not conformed to the world's thinking. And you think about Jello for a second, right? Who's somebody's laughing? Jello, right? And you pour it into a bowl and you put it in the fridge and it sets and you take it out and take it out of the bowl and flip it over. It's conformed. Or if you put it in a different kind of mold, it's conformed. It's conformed to whatever the mold is you're using. So if, if we're using the mold of the world, our thinking is going to be just like the world. He says, don't be conformed to the world. It opposes God's things. It's telling you, what is, what is Paul telling us to do, right? Surrender. Be self, selfless. And the world is telling us the exact opposite. Get all you can for yourself. It's the exact opposite. That's why we can't be conformed to the world. From verse 3 onwards, it talks about all these kind of behaviors and things. And if we're conformed to these things, I don't think we can, we can live the way that he wants us to live. Our lives will be barren, will be no fruit, will be like unhappy um, if we do those things. I was reading a little passage by uh, Watchman Nee in his book called Separation of the World, and I want to read what, one of the things he said because I like the way he said it. Um, we're familiar with the Old Testament story about uh, the Israelites when they were in Egypt, right? And they were trying to be called out and serve the Lord. So it kind of comes from that. He says, if you're trying to serve God in the world, you will surely end up being Satan's slave. You will have to make bricks for him, and he will not let you go. And even if he does, he will not let you go too far. If he lets you go, he may only allow you the, the strong men to go, the rest will have to stay. See, Satan is quite familiar with the words of Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. 
Here, get this. He knew that if Pharaoh held back the cattle and the sheep, the people would not go too far. They have, the people would eventually follow the cattle and the sheep. God wanted them to go with the cattle and the sheep. He wanted them all to go. So, you know what I mean? Um, our treasure is where our heart is, right? After a person is saved, he must go out. <laughs> Time to go out. And um, he has to bring all the treasures with him. Otherwise, he's going to go back to Egypt. And that's happened, right? We've seen that, right? When people don't follow the Lord, they run back to the world. They run back to where their treasure is. There has to be separation. And God wanted them to be called out and separated. I thought that was a neat little story. Because, you know, the cattle and the sheep don't take those with you. And he knew that the people would come back. Because that was their treasure. Isn't it? That was their treasure. So do not be conformed to this world. It will bring us down. But be ye transferred by the renewing of your mind. And this word transformed, I think, is uh, another command. Um, it is about being transformed. It's like keep on being transformed. It's not a one-time deal. And it's by the renewing of your mind. It's like a metamorphosis, right? It's a total change from the inside out. And, and that's how it's going to happen. Um, we have to renew our minds. We have to think like him. We have to let the Spirit of God transform us, if you will. And how does that work? How does the Spirit of God transform us? Is it the same? Is it, is it consistent? Are we looking for him to do certain things and, and that's outside of his realm? But I wanted to go back just for a picture, if you will, to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And I hope this is a little picture of what the Spirit does. How it transforms, how it transfigures, if you will. And, you know, stop and think about this, right? In Genesis chapter 1, the verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Why do we need more detail than that? He decided to give us a whole chapter about it. And he just made the statement in verse 1 that he created the heavens and the earth. So what can we learn, right? What can we learn from it a little bit? It tells us a little bit about our God. It tells us a little bit how he does things, right? It tells us a little bit how he works. It tells us why we are created, right? The purpose of our creation. Who created us, who owns us, and what we're created for, right? But I want to point out verse 2. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we know, you know that the Spirit of God is involved in creation. And I'm going to submit to you that three things that he brought in verse 2 to us, and that's how the Spirit of God moves, if you will. Okay? Um, maybe you'll see this effective in, in, in your lives when the Spirit of God is working. Maybe we see it in our church <clears throat> when the Spirit of God is working. So it said the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. One of the things that the Spirit of God will bring, there was darkness there, and he brought light. The Spirit of God brought light. It was out without form and void, and, and he brought form, if you will. He, he created the, word, the world. He brought it uh, to a point where there is a um, pattern, if you will. Uh, so he brought form, and he filled the earth with its fullness, right? And the third thing, uh, as you read down a little bit further, is he brought life. So the Spirit of God, when it's moving, he'll bring illumination, he'll bring order and form, and he'll bring life. And those are three keys, I think. When the Spirit of God is moving and he transforms you, that's what we'd expect to see. Having you know, kind of thought about that, the other place that the word transformed is used is in um, Matthew 17, when the Lord was transfigured, right? 
from the inside out, the, the Lord was shining bright, if you will. Um, and the other place that it's used is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But let's go back to uh, Romans 12 uh, for that. I think it's helpful to consider how the Spirit of God moves and what He's going to do, because I, I believe He's very consistent in what He do and what He's going to do. He is going to um, provide form and structure, if you will. He's going to uh, bring light to darkness, <clears throat> and He is going to uh, bring life, if you will. So, um, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You know, the mind is the key. The mind is the key. When you think about the mind and how it's used in Romans, in, um, in the mind uh, in Romans, I believe it was used 15 times in 13 verses, if you do a little word search on it. 11 of those 15 times are found in chapter 7 through 12. The mind is very heavily associated with our assurance of being in Christ in that. And when you think about the mind, really that's what Satan attacks us, if you will, right? It's the mind. He doesn't need to say a word, but he gets a little thought and he puts it in here subconsciously. And as we think on it and ruminate on it, all of a sudden we, we start to get behind it, if you will. It'll be like, yeah, I deserve that. That's fine. That's not a problem. And before you know it, he's got us falling into his snare and, and his temptation hangs us high. So Satan's temptations, you know, um, we need to uh, renew our minds and, and think like the Word of God. You know, God wants to transform our minds, right? He wants to change them. If the world controls our thinking, then we're going to be a conformer. We're going to be just like them. If God controls our thinking, we're going to be a transformer. Um, God transforms our minds and makes us spiritually minded. And as you spend time meditating on His Word, memorizing it, making it part of your inner man, He will gradually make your mind more spiritual. He will change you from the inside out, if you will. And, and that metamorphosis that we talked about will take place by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God, how he, um, how he changes us from the outside in. In Ephesians 4, the word mind is used, and it talks about not to walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And when I went to Genesis and we pointed out those three things, it seems like um, when we're talking about the futility of our minds, it's the exact opposite of what we found in Genesis, right? It's because the Spirit of God is not working. Verse 18 says, having their understanding darkened, darkened right? We talked about the Spirit, and it was giving a light to darkness. Here, in the futility of your mind, having your understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. It goes from, you know, order to chaos when we don't have our minds renewed. And for sake of time, we're going to move on. And Colossians also, set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. It's chaos when our minds are not renewed. It's chaos when our minds are not renewed. Having go back uh, to, to Romans 12, so be not conformed to this world, right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And God will give us a path. If we give him our will, he will give us a path. If you give him our body, you give him our mind, and give him your will. Let's say a word again, surrender. All of a sudden you'll find you're on the path. And, you know, many people choose not to follow the path, right? You may be at, you know, nobody's perfect at it. The Lord Jesus was, but no one else has got it figured out, right? The mess man that God used was Paul, and he made mistakes. But if you want to consider someone who said, you know what, that's just a bunch of hooey. I'm not going to follow that. I'm just going to do my own thing. Maybe they're never sa saved at all. And I was thinking of an example that I could share with you. And, and I found one um, that kind of stuck with me um, of a man who was uh, extremely successful in the world. He was a billionaire, and he died when he was 56. And you guys probably know his name. Maybe you're holding one of his devices in your pocket today, Steve Jobs. 
right? One of his last words, and, and I'll, I'll read a little bit to you. He said, I have reached the pinnacle of success in business. In other people's eyes, my life is a success. However, aside from my work, I've had little joy. At the end of the day, wealth is just a fact I've gotten used to. Right now, I'm lying in a hospital bed reminiscing all my life. I realize that all the recognition and wealth I took so much pride in has faded and become meaningless in the face of imminent death. You can hire someone to drive your car or make money for you, but you can't hire someone to stand sick and die for you. Material things lost can be found again, but there is one thing that can never be found when it's lost. Life. Whatever stage of life we are currently at, in time we will all face the day when the curtain closes. Love your family, your spouse, your children, your friends. Treat them right and cherish them. As we get older and wiser, we slowly realize that wearing a $300 or a $30 watch both give you the same time. Whether you drive a $150,000 car or a $30,000 car, the road and the distance are the same. We reach the same destination. Whether you're in a house which you live in is 100 or 1,000 square meters, loneliness is the same. You realize that your true inner happiness does not come from material things of this world. From a man that was a billionaire, 56 years old, right? Whether you travel first class or economy class, if the plane crashes, you go down with it. <laughs> right? And, you know, I think some of those words kind of hit home because we, we have a choice when we consider this passage today, right? Paul says, I appeal to you. I urge you, I beg you, surrender, let God have control of your life. And it won't turn out like this. It won't turn out like Steve Jobs, who was a billionaire and found no joy, no satisfaction. He didn't know the Lord. And I'm reminded of some other words um, that the Lord Jesus spoke, right? In Matthew 10, 39. And it's this, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. The key to victory, surrender. To understanding these verses, surrender. And let God conform our minds, let him have our bodies, give him our will, and let him make what he would make of it. It's a challenge, because we still have this will in here, and we still want to do our own things. But that is, I think, the summation of Romans 1 through 11 up to this point, it comes down to a decision. We have to make that decision and put ourselves on the altar. Sometimes he may ask us hard things. I was sitting over there thinking through the songs and my mind went to Jim Elliott, right? Gave it all. Very famous man now. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we've considered a lot of things, and we've seen your Spirit moving, how it brought form and fullness and brought light and then gave life. And Father, we desperately need your life in our lives. Father, we pray that you would just use these thoughts today to help us think on them as we go forth and consider areas of our lives where we, we may not have surrendered to you, Father. So we look to you in these things. Do what we can for your glory, that it would bring pleasure to you, we'd ask in your Son's name, the Lord Jesus. Amen.